Shall I get started? Yes. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, before I start, I want to go over the stupid slide off. Maybe we can switch up this slide. Can, can all of you say which, which is the subject that you're studying now? Microbiology. Microbiology, microbiology. Yes. Okay. Biotechnology and microbiology. How many have done, are doing now the biotechnology? Can you just raise your hands? At the rest of our microbiology, and with due respects to faculty, uh, can I know uh, from which departments are you on? How many are from us? Okay, very good. So what I'm going to do today is a very fundamental biology of how each of us have really developed. You know, you must have studied in school, you must have studied, some of you must have studied in college and they are studying in college. And what I'm going to tell is uh, how we were born and what were the mechanisms of development that control our birth and how does it happen and does it normally happen or is there any problems of happening at normal development and why do we study this? Number one question. And how important it is to study this? Number two question. And number three is, what can we do for it? If there are some problems. You know, this will affect everybody and it's not just uh, uh, one or two individuals. The development per se is an important thing for each one of us. Okay? So having said that, I'll just tell you what is that I'm going to come up with. So this is basically the, the background of my talk. I will talk something about mammalian development. Don't worry about uh, the terminology. I'll make it as simple as possible. Because at the end of the talk, I want to make sure that you understood what I was trying to say. If not 100%, maybe 50%, maybe 70%. But I will find out whether you understood that or not. And for students, I'll give you one challenge. I will ask you one or two quiz questions from what I have projected. And let me see whether you can give me an answer at the end of the talk. Okay? And I'll give you a price before I go. Students, are you with me? Huh? Are you able to follow what I'm thinking? I just want to make sure that you understand. Uh, it's very difficult for me to talk. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So, first thing you need to know is how we were born. We, we have to be thankful to our parents. They have gifted us the sperm. The father has given us the sperm. Mother has given us the oocyte. And why are they important? Because the oocyte gives all the genes and the characteristics arising out of the genes from the mother. The same thing from the father, we have got the sperm. And therefore, we have genetic makeup from both the parents. This is something which is important. When does it occur? It occurs. It occurs during gametogenesis, that is the production of the sperm or production of the oocyte, and these two fuse by a process known as fertilization. Fertilization makes the sperm and the oocyte to come together, so that the father's genes and the mother's genes are together, and that will be there in this fertilized egg, and therefore to share the genetic makeup of both the father and the mother. And therefore, we will have some behavior of the father, some behavior of the mother. But maybe good behavior of the mother, maybe good behavior of the father. A not so good behavior of the mother, not so good behavior of the father. It's a genetic mix-up. We are gifted. God has given that genetic composition. We have to live with that for our life. Okay? But what we should know is, these 
developments occur at the very, very early stages. I'm showing very few stages of development, and I will tell you why is important and where does it occur. Before we find this out, you should remember that reproduction and any aspects related to the reproduction is controlled by hypothalamus pituitary and gonads. Remember three things: pituitary, anterior pituitary is in the brain, right? At the floor of the brain. And we have above that is hypothalamus in the part of the brain. And you have pituitary and the pituitary as the gonad. Why am I showing this? This is the master regulator of any aspects of reproduction. If I am born as a male and someone is born as a female, during our development within the mother's womb, these hormones play an important role to determine that you become a male or you become a female. If these hormones which are produced by the pituitary is not produced correctly, not produced at the right time, you may not have the right kind of the sexuality. You would have not become a female, or you would have not become a male, or you would have been a mix of both. And this happens during fetal development within the mother's womb. Everybody thinks that the person who is male or female is because of chromosomes. Sex chromosome, X, Y, X, X chromosome. Do you know that the person who has XX chromosome can become a male? Do you know that a person who has XY can be a female? Have you heard of this? Intersexuality or sexual hermaphroditism. Have you heard of it? Yes or no? Yes or no? Or I don't know. Somebody can tell from students. How many will say yes? So, what is important is hypothalamus produces an important hormone called gonadotropin release hormone, GNRH. And that gonadotropin release hormone releases pituitary gonadotropins. Gonadotropins. I don't know that you heard in your school and things like that. Pituitary gonadotropin profit are two hormones, follicle stimulating hormones and luteinizing hormones. Have you heard? So FSH and LH are produced in the pituitary in both male or as well as female. And those hormones are produced and released into the blood only when GnRH gonadotropin release hormone from the hypothalamus is produced. So hypothalamus, a brain and the brain hormone controls endocrine gland here to produce FSH and LH. And FSH and LH acts on the gonads. In the male it is testis, in the female it is ovary. Right? So the gonads are controlled by gonadotropins. Gonadotropin is a tropic to gonads. Goes and acts on gonads. And that's controlled by the brain. You may wonder why. Now, brain hormone produced by brain activity, behavioral pressure, all those behavioral pressures will affect gonadotropin. So if you are very stressed for money, multiple reasons, all of us are stressed, I am stressed, you are stressed, everybody is stressed. If you are very, very stressed, this gonadotropin releasing hormone production will be slowed down. If that is slowed down, gonadotropins cannot be produced in right amount by the pituitary. And if that is slow, gonadal function will be affected. Normally or abnormally. Okay? So what I am trying to tell is, gonadotropin release hormone is the master hormone of the brain, acts on the pituitary to produce gonadotropins, Gonadotropin act on the gonads. Why? What do they do with gonads? It does, it does two things. It has to produce gametes. In the case of male, it has to produce sperm. In the case of ovary, it has to produce oocyte, female. 
and they are controlled by the poor, Bernard and Robin, both species, both sexes. And this will do what? It produces gametes and it produces steroid hormones. So, gametogenesis and steroidogenesis are two major functions of the gonads. Gametogenesis, steroidogenesis. These two are produced here. So, you can remember hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis is very important for sex determination during fetal development in the female. When the mother is pregnant, the fetus gets determined whether it will become a male or a female fetus and therefore a male or a female child. That's controlled by hypothalamus pituitary gonadotropins. Okay? After birth, when we attain sexual maturity, after three adolescents and you are becoming sexually mature, whether it's a male or a female, it's because of the activation of gonadotropin release in hormone, pituitary and testis in a cyclical manner. And if that happens in a mature way, only there is sexual maturity. If that doesn't happen for some reason, there will not be sexual maturity. So you remember how important this one is. And if these hormones are produced normally, they will produce normal gametogenesis, normal steroidogenesis. I'm talking about steroidogenesis, sex steroid hormones, the male testosterone and the female estrogen. If these hormones are not produced, the reproductive system will not work normally and therefore you won't have hormone development. These are the important things that one needs to remember. Okay, where does it happen is a very fundamental question and it happens in the reproductive tract and fertilization occurs in the far end of the fallopian. Look at my arms. And if this is the uterus body and this is the fallopian tube and my fingers are called fimbria. And this is kind of an ampullary region. And that's where the ovary. Do you know that the ovary and the fimbria is not connected? So the ovary is an organ in the pelvis floating like that, let's say. And fallopian tube is just around the ovary. I'll ask you one question. When ovulation occurs in the ovary, when oocyte comes out of the ovary, you tell me how it will get into the fallopian tube or ovidans and, and how the embryo develops. Will it get lost? And if so, where does it get lost? Can anybody answer later on? And these are the earliest stages fertilization, two cell embryo, four cell embryo, eight cell embryo, four and so forth. And it occurs in the reproductive tract. First three, four days, it occurs in the fallopian tube or the oviduct. After four days, it occurs in the uterus. So the embryo moves from the fallopian tube to the uterus. Okay? And these embryos, all the stages, is a free floating embryo that can be together. No contact anywhere. It's just going through. If you take a long tube and put a small pebble and toss it like this, it will just go inside. No contact. And that's how the development occurs. It is not attached. It is not implanted. For the first five days or six days, it is not implanted. It is free floating in the fallopian tube and in the uterine tube. And that embryo development is called before implantation development. And it's called pre implantation development of embryos. I mean, making you understand? Pre implantation development. Okay? Now, it is a miracle how this embryo actually develops from a very single embryo. You get trillions of embryos, trillions of cells in the entire body now. We have trillions of cells. From one cell, it becomes trillions of cells. When we develop, an offspring is born, and then we become adult, we have trillions of cells. Isn't that a miracle how one cell makes it? And it is made because of multiple reasons are going to that. So, just to summarize ovary, ovulation, fertilization, pre implantation embryo development, and the 
these are the embryo stages that develops and they are all like one ball of cell and then it becomes two balls, four. So these are total cells, two cell, four cell, eight cell. You may wonder what is this arithmetic of two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four? Is it really happening like a typical mathematics, or there is something different? Actually, it should happen in that manner. But if it doesn't happen, then there's a problem. So remember that becomes two cell, four cell, eight is sixteen cell, and what happens is when these things happen within the within the encasement, at this stage the embryos are actually covered by a glycoprotein coat on the zone of its It's like an egg. We have seen the chicken egg and it has a shell. Like these embryos are developing within a shell, a protective cover. And these cells are dividing inside and there is no space for the cells to divide outside. It has to develop within the cell, within that protective coat, zone of its and there is a crowding there and therefore when the cells come together quickly they do two things, they will fuse together and they will go through changes and that changes are called differences. The behavior of one cell will become different because it is not crowded. And that is what happens here when the whole number of cells are formed, they undergo differences, they change. They become different cell types. These are something which I'll show you. And these things happen in the reproductive tract for the first five days. You can ask the question: Is it possible to get this development to occur not within the body but outside the body? If I give you a lab, can you do it? Can I uh, get sperm from somebody, oocyte from somebody, put them together, make them to develop? And how far can it develop? Can anybody say how far it can develop? Last two cells. Sorry? Last two cells. Okay. Why it cannot develop after the last two? Okay. So you can develop the embryo up to the last six days. After that, it is really difficult. It's not actually very difficult. There are mechanisms which are coming up where you can get post implantation development like that. But that's a different matter. So that's what we want. I don't want to go into detail because these are the areas of what we do. We work on sperm. I will not tell what we do, but I want to tell what we should know. Okay? So we do all different things. We use uh, rodent models, primate models and even humans to understand development. So in the last 40, 40, 40, 40 years, I've been working on uh, mouse, I've been working on hamster, rat, some domestic animals, primates, that is the non-human primates, and the pri primates are, you know what are primates are? Do you know what are primates? Huh? Are we primates? Am I a primate? Are you a primate? Yes, no? Huh? Are we a primate? How many will say yes? Only one person? Among the faculty, are we a primate? Yes. 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 We are. We are among the past mammals and all of primates. And why we are called primates? We are the prime most species in the order of primates, in the top of that class mammals. Because we are the most evolved in terms of brain development, in terms of cognition, in terms of intelligence, in terms of usage of the appendages. So we are the best among the species of the world in terms of conquering many things. Okay, and that's we are primates. And among the primates there are difference and these are non-human primates, they are very close to us in terms of their makeup, in terms of the brain development, but the human beings are the most important. So remember that. But so we use those and I will tell you why we do that. And before we do that, I just want to show you two 
or three videos for you to understand how these things really happen. I said the male is responsible for producing sperm, father's DNA has to go, and the female is responsible for the oocyte, and you have an oocyte here. So the oocyte has mother's genes, the sperm has father's teeth. Okay? Now, if the father is producing the sperm, it has to reach the female reproductive tract, whatever it is, I can tell. And it has to reach, so it, the sperm is a very interesting entity. It's actually a highly evolved cell. Most versatile cell type that you can see. And oocyte is a spherical structure. Sperm is a very flagellated structure. It has a very small nucleus, virtually no cytoplasm, a long tail. Have you any time understood why it has evolved like that? For a moment, from where to where? From the entire of the female reproductive tract, it has to move. If it has to move, it has to have energy. And therefore, the sperm cell is completely evolved. It has maintained the nucleus because it has to stand the father's genes. It has retained mitochondria because it has to have energy. It doesn't require all the rest of the cytoplasmic organelle. So it threw out. But retain the cytoskeleton and therefore fragile them with falls. Why? It can swim and reach the oocyte. And therefore it's a highly flagellated similar to ancient uh, paramecium and things like that. You know, very highly flagellated kind of stuff. It retained those old kind of development for the purpose of travel in the reproductive tract and reach the oocyte in the fallopian tube. And therefore, the sperm has acquired fertility so that it can swim. And swimming is not just swimming like this, but the sperm should be hyperactively swimming. And that hyperactivation of the sperm, very vigorous activation of the sperm, goes to a lot of biochemistry. How much have you studied biochemistry, glycolysis, DC cycle, protein, protein phosphorylation? Have you heard of all this? All these things happen in the sperm for sperm to become extremely motile for its traditional cycle. And if some biochemistry is not happening, some enzyme is not produced, some protein is not there, or some protein is not phosphorylated, what will happen? or some energy is not produced. The sperm will not go. It will die. There is no fertilization. There is no child birth. And that's called infertility. So there can be a reason why infertility is happening that may be due to male problem or a sperm defect problem. And so what I'm going to show here is what is known as hyperactivity. The sperm is in a storehouse for the epididymis, it's a storehouse. There, millions of sperm is there in the epididymis, but it's a sleeping sperm. So when it's ejaculated, it goes through a process known as capacitation or hyperactivation. It just becomes awakened and goes very fast after ejaculation. And that hyperactivation phenomenon is controlled by a lot of biochemistry. Of and so on and so forth. And that's what I will show here as to what it really means. This is the normal sperm. You may think it is moving fast, but it's actually not enough. It should become a hyperactivated kind of a motility, and that is right here. This is hyperactive sperm. The sperm has to move like a big flash. Chatty. That is how it should move. Only then you can fertilize the oocyte. And I will tell you, there are so many sperm that will go and try to fertilize the oocyte. But how many sperm is required for fertilization? Can somebody say? How many will say more than one? Huh? 
Can there be two sperm fertilizer? Outside? Yes, no. Yes. What will happen? Huh? If it is monospermically fertilized, if the outside is fertilized only by a single sperm, that will be leading to a normal development of a fetus. If there are two sperm, it becomes a trisomic embryo and that will not go to a normal development. Mother itself will not let it be developed. It will go through many times miscarriages. So mother nature has come up with a mechanism not to let it go through and make mother and parents suffer. So there are different mechanisms and are not going So it should be monospermically fertilized. But I question here, when there are so many sperm, how only one sperm fertilizes and embryo develops? It's something which I want somebody to answer at the end of the talk. Okay, I'll skip all this. There are a lot of biotechnical uh, uh, remarks. So, remember how only one sperm is able to fertilize. <coughs> Why the next sperm doesn't get entry? The gate is shut. How does it happen? Let me see if somebody can help. Okay. So this is after fertilization. So you have father's DNA, mother's DNA. It's called pronucleus. Father's pronucleus, mother's pronucleus. And these two are haploid in nature. Haploid cell, you know haploid cell type. Haploid in nature, when they fuse together, they become diploid. And only after diploidy, the embryo will form two cells, no cells, eight cells, so on and so forth. All these embryos are now covered with the somatic system. It's a protective glycoprotein coat around the embryo. So they keep multiplying and multiplying. When there is no space, the dark cells that are around here will fuse together. They come together and fuse with each other. Fuse, 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 fuse. When there are too many cells, that happens. And then the cell cell intimate contact. And that fusion is called result in molecular formation or a mulberry like of cell. So these cells will now occupy outermost in a fused cell, joint cell. And that's different from the rest of the cell inside. Okay? These cells are similar to these, but this is differentiated, changed, and these are fused together. And they have a different property. These have a different property. These are the same like these cells. And so these are called totiopotent cells. What is totiopotency? Each cell has got the same complement of father and mother. All these dark cells. So if I take out this one and put it here at the end of that, and I take this and put it here, what will happen to that? That will behave like that. One cell is this will also be a like a one cell and it becomes two cells, four cells. So you will have two identical, genetically identical embryo development occurs. And they are called identical twins if that happens. You understand what I'm saying? Same thing if I take these four cells, I will go and use the microscope and hand pick one, put here, and they have four different petri tissues and make them to develop, I will get quadruplets. And these are called embryo cloning. Embryo cloning. So each one will be genetically identical. In genetic makeup, in the way the organism is born. Okay, but will they be same? After one year, 10 years, 20 years, 60 years, what is the answer? Will identical twins be the same? In every manner. This is the second question I'm asking. Remember the medicine what it is. That's what it is. I'm going to show you this development that is taking place. I said this modula and it formed. He said, the first person here, he said blastocyst. That is a cavity which is filled inside the embryo. And that cavity keeps on with filling and filling and filling and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And it becomes expanded blastocyst. Fully expanded blastocyst. Why it should expand? 
it expands to rupture this zone of addition. Without a force, it has to cut it out. It's like a balloon filled with water. You keep on with filling with water or air. What happens? It burst. Why it should burst? Because the embryo should now see the mother's womb, mother's uterine wall, for it to go and attach. And that's called implantation. And if implantation has to occur, this embryo has to come out of this outermost case called zona pedicida. Okay? So, that blastocyst development and coming out for implantation are very important events. And if that doesn't happen, the embryo will be like that, it will die and there will not be implantation, there will not be pregnancy. Am I making it clear? No. Now there are little dots here. This is the third question. I want you to find out what are those dots. Okay? We use different animal species to study and it's very difficult. That's why it's important to study comparative zoology. What are different animals doing? How they are doing? How they develop? Why mouse uh, is so small and mouse development takes only 19 days? Hamster takes also similar amount, maybe about 60 days. And monkey will take 165 days to produce a baby. Humans take 285 days to produce a human being. Why are these different days for development? Or what is the reason why gestation periods are very different? Have you written thought? Have you thought? Why human beings should take 285 days? Why can't there be a baby for now? Two months, five months. Why mouse takes only 19 days? Small organ. Therefore, they take small time. Big organ. Elephant? How long you take? So, we work on different species to understand this development and then the reason why. Unfortunately, they are not coming out well here. But I, I will tell you. This is a hatching process. How embryo comes out of the zone of the sky. And I'll just show you this video. I don't know if it's distorted, maybe because of the density or something. Uh, it doesn't matter. But this is the embryo that develops. It ruptures the zona pellucida and, 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 and it just comes out of the zona pellucida. The embryo has to act out of the zona pellucida, the outermost covering. Only then, this blastocyst can oppose the material and it may be first by a process known as implantation. If implantation doesn't take place, there is no pregnancy. If hatching doesn't take place, there is no implantation. You understand? Embryo development, hatching process and implantation are very critical for establishment of pregnancy. If that doesn't happen, there is no pregnancy. That's the reason why biologists Mammalian biologists, embryo biologists study these events to understand how development occurs, what are the cellular features, biochemical features, molecular features that control development, and what are the abnormalities that may take place so that we understand if somebody is not conceiving, if some animal is not becoming pregnant or human is not becoming pregnant, you understand what are the reasons. So we as biologists find this out and give solutions to the doctor. And the doctors implement those solutions. That's the reason why what we study in our colleges, higher learning, during PhD program, become important to manage the reproductive health. To manage the health and the reproductive health. So this is the action process. And if that has to There is no audio here, it's not connected to the audio and that. So, I'm not so excited. Actually, it's a very beautiful uh, video that we BBC has covered to show in real time how ovulation occurs in females and how fertilization occurs. 
and how method development occurs first we are all this is the overview which is showing and this is the hello gate view by the show you know and combination occurs and and it's tracked by the test and that's what i show here how that happens is from this form but actually the tracker look at this you can see it i can show it very much but you see here that's the only and that's the only these are the peculiar lens there is an audio the peculiar lens is touching the only for ovulation to take place for the outside to come out so it's going and rubbing on the ovulation site when the outside to come and, and that will be the ovulation where the outside comes out and gets in the pelvic tube and that's what the process is known as ovulation and that's controlled by the hormone and if the hormones are not there this ovulation does not take place and this is the bunch of somatic cells and in that there will be a little outside okay and you will see that So that is the ovulated outside sitting right there around with cells around it and, and that outside will now has to get fertilized by the sperm and it should be fertilized by a single sperm and that outside is sitting in the fallopian tube waits for the sperm to come and fertilize and the lifespan of that outside is only few hours and if the sperm is not there in those few hours that outside is that. Is that clear? And that's the outside. And now the sperm will come and fertilize here. And one sperm fertilize. And many, many, many thousands and millions of sperm will die in the different plant. Only few sperm will go. And why only one sperm will try to enter into the outside? So if you look at the egg outside around it, there will be so many sperm. But only one enters and fertilizes and delivers the father's deep which is inside to the mother's outside. Therefore, this is fertilized. This is a fertilized egg, and there are two little stuff here. Can anybody say? Think about this two little stuff. This is the father's DNA, this is the mother's DNA, they're coming together and fused together. And therefore, they can complement the both the father and the mother. And this is a cycle. After that, the embryo will go to mitotic cleavage division, real mitosis, and it will form two cells, four cells, and so on and so forth. And that's what is early uh, development. It's a very difficult cell biology that goes here, and I'm not going to explain it. Then the mitotic cleavage division, three cells, four cells, and so on and so forth. So that is the Very nice, many things can happen here, many things cannot happen as well. If these things don't happen, then there is no area for this. There is no area for this. And that's why this is a big part to understand how this development uh, really takes place. Okay? So, I just showed here this development and it's as it does not take place, there is no implantation. If as it takes place, there is successful implantation. And if this does not happen, there is no pregnancy. And that's why it becomes important to, to understand how this thing happens. I'm not going to detail what are we doing. Look at the development and everything is important. And there are many reasons why this may not happen. I've given a list of the reasons why. Don't happen, but if they don't happen, what the solution that we can be? Like I said, we can get this development to take place in a petri dish. We can take if, if, if a, a married couple is not uh, able to produce their child, can we assist them maybe to produce their own biological child? So you can take the sperm from the father, you can take the oocyte from the mother. Do the fertilization in vitro. 
and it's called in between the fertilization. What can happen inside in the melotin egg? You can make it happen in the petri dish. Like you said, you can make it to develop to about four or five days. And what you can do, you can transfer this embryo back to the uterus. What if there is a problem in the uterus of that particular mother, prospective mother? Then you have to request someone else to become carriers of that particular people. And that's called surrogate, surrogacy. You know? And that surrogacy also is possible where the embryo, if there is a problem of that particular mother, to take the embryo. But there are multiple reasons are there for this happening. This entire technology of in vitro development is mastered by several biologists, several uh, uh, Typical, typical medicine people, and one of the person who mastered this is Robert Edwards, and he got the Nobel Prize for this. He is right there. Last time I know, he visited our institute, and the lady who was the heart of this, Mac uh, Warren, and uh, you know, he was credited to have produced the first IT radio that had been produced in Kumar and myself, and we are with Edwards and our Robert President. Okay, so many things happen, and in the IVF clinic, many approaches are available. We do this, and, and, and one can achieve that one. One big question that still is there, which is the research, is uh, when we produce embryos by this assisted reproductive technology or IVF approach, how do we know that uh, if you produce four embryos, how do you know first embryo is good, or second, or third, or fourth embryo? Which embryo you will hand pick and give it to the mother for transfer? How do you know which is good? By looking at it, morphologically it looks nice. Can it do this transfer? Are the fourth embryo is looking good and send it to the transfer? We don't know that. Every other just looking at the microscope says this is good, it's not so good. But that's not enough. So there must be a way to find out the quality of embryo by some markers. They're called biomarkers. A good embryo will produce a very good level. Like, I want to know whether I am diabetic, or I want to know whether somebody here is diabetic. What do we do? We go to the doctor, they take a blood sample, and they test how much glucose is there. If glucose is high, I may be diabetic. If it is not there, in the high level, it is not diabetic. So that's a marker. Similarly, embryo may produce a marker, and if you measure that marker, you will know how good that embryo is, and these are called biomarkers. To judge the quality of the embryo, other than by looking at it. Because if I look at it, this embryo may be good, fourth embryo is not good. And this gentleman may say, fourth is good and one is not good. Subjective. Each one will have their own assessment. Perceptions are different. But a biomarker which is produced, if they are measured, by allies or whatever, they will not make mistakes. So that's why there's a huge research that's going on, our own lab also. And, and to find out how good is that embryo which can be used for transfer. Okay, how good is that embryo which can be used? So that you get a definitive results. And that's what really we have uh, the kind of research that goes on. So I'm not going to let you things on the market. Uh, let's play it out. One of them. Okay, under five minutes, you speak. Okay, that, that's all about what embryo development is. One of the options of embryo development biologists, what they have done is they have been able to produce stem cells out of this embryo. You know, this is the blastocyst. These are the cells which are inside. So take the cells and put it in a petri dish and make these cells, make these cells only multiply. You should not undergo different things. You know, we have 210 plus cell types in our body. And I don't want those cells to pick up different cell types. I want them to remain the same. So if those cells are multiplied and multiplied and multiplied without undergoing differentiation, you call them as stem cell puppets. And if they are coming from embryos, they are called embryonic stem cells. So every cell type in our body is made out of these 
cells, stem cells, which are there inside. Okay? If you take it out, you get a stem cell line. So I can produce these cells in thousands and millions, and I can give you that to each one of you here, and you can do it, let's say, in your lab, and you can produce your own stem cells again and again. And that's the beauty of the stem cells. Why do you need stem cells? You need stem cells to understand how development occurs. Suppose uh, I want to study how brain cells are formed. What, what really happens when the brain cells are formed? What are the molecules that are required? Or uh, he wants to know how heart cells are formed. And what are the control for making stem cells to become heart cells? Somebody else wants to know uh, insulin producing uh, beta cells, pancreatic beta cells, or liver cells. Kidney cell. So many types of cells, can you make them in vitro? Question is, why do you want to make them? You want to make them because you want to know how they are made in our body. Can you understand how to make it in the lab? Why do you need to make it? Suppose if I have a heart patient and I want heart cells, I don't have a good number of heart cells. I, I got a heart attack and I, my cells are dead. I want to put heart cells, fresh heart cells, from stem cells. Or I am dilating, I want pancreatic beta cells. And I want beta cells formed in the lab, and I want to put it into my pancreas. These are the approaches which you can do using the stem cells, and that's the application. And there are different types of stem cells, I'm not going to detail. I get a lot of scientists, good friends of mine, and I will show you. Some of these are produced now. What happens are pictures of stem cells from embryos and, and they look like this and they are methods to analyze these are really stem cells and there are methods to find out stem cells can form the entire organism. Once one stem cell can form one individual. If I give you thousand stem cells, you can effectively produce thousand individuals if you do an embryo transfer. You know, that's the power of it. There are different ways of doing all this. Right? They can differentiate to endocrine derived brain cells, they can differentiate to endocrine derived pancreatic cells or liver cells, they can differentiate to derived muscle cells, heart cells, whatever cells. And I'm, I'm telling this because you can do it. And we have done it. And I'll show you that. There's a method to do this in vitro, and I'll show you that out of the stem cell, we can get heart cells. And how many of you are able to see this here? Can you see something contracting? Can you see something contracting? And those are stem cell derived heart cells. Cardiomyocytes. They are contracting. And I'll show you a bigger picture of that. These are heart cells. This is heart cells which are formed from stem cells. So, these are enriched form of heart cells derived from stem cells. You can purify this and if that has to be transplanted into my body, I can transplant it. But not these cells, these are mouse cells. You can also produce this from the humans. And if you use human cells, you can transplant it to the human. Okay? That's what it is. that is here. These are the purified form of the heart cells. You can see them being purified, pure cardiomyocyte, pure heart cells. And you can do this. Similarly, you can also get smooth muscle cells. These are smooth muscles. What are smooth muscles? These are autonomous contracting cells. They are not heart cells. They are not skeletal muscles. They are not skeletal muscles in the wall and muscles. You tell to contract and you are contracting, therefore I have to start. But smooth muscles are autonomous contractile cells which are there in the respiratory tracts, intestinal epithelium, blood vessels, they contract, right? Blood vessels, otherwise the blood supply will not go, right? So those are smooth muscles. And this is a smooth muscle derived from the stem cell. Similarly, you can also get. Skeletal muscle. This is a skeletal muscle. You can see that contracting. And and if you change, if you change condition, how these are produced, 
you can get brain cells. There are different types of brain cells depending on what kind of neurotransmitters are produced. Do you know the neurotransmitters brain cells produce? You have GABA producing, dopamine producing, acetylcholine producing, so many neurotransmitters that if dopamine producing neuronal cells are not there, you get Parkinson's you know, involuntary movements. Age people get this. And that's because dopamine is producing that brain cells are not producing enough. Therefore, there is no control. So, if you can make dopamine producing neurons from stem cells and do a transplantation, you can reverse the Parkinson's disease that the human beings suffer from. And that's the reason why these steps of research are extremely important. Okay, and we uh, were teaching college a long time ago in our in our uh, in my lab, and uh, unfortunately uh, uh, there's no idea connected here. So it was a long time ago they came and covered our research and then showed. Uh, this is a very because it's kind of a popular lecture. I thought I'd add this because. Uh, a news person will tell in a manner which is very understandable. I have to tell as much as I can, you know, but but they have a knack of showing what a research and its implications are. And his father, Bagla, uh, is one of the science editors of Indian University. And uh, he showed how this entire research is doing, what are the implications in this So it's just normal that happens. Trying to show how you are able to produce heart cells, heart cells, heart stem cells. Yes, what we should get. So, how is it that this is happening? And how it takes, how much it takes, how much money is required, what kind of infrastructure is required, all that is required. So, you know, some of the students are in different places. So, so that, that is basically uh, what it is, but I just show you uh, one thing. We try to do this in the mouse and see how these cells can be produced so that you can transplant it into an animal system. Then later on, a similar approach can be used for the human for alleviating, uh, let's say, heart attack patients or whatever. And that's the implications of these studies. Okay, and uh, there's a different method of doing those things that I'm not going to detail. And this is, for example, human cells. Human stem cell producing beating heart, heart cell. So you can do this in the petri dish, you can do it on a printer paper. You know, the, we don't call this typical as a printer paper, we call it a scaffold. You can take it as a small piece of white sheet, which is basically made by in the lab. And those cells can be thrown on a small little white sheet, paper, filter paper, and then you can, and, and I'll show you that in a moment. This is how the stem cells were developing on a small filter paper. Why do you need this small filter paper? So if there is a, a heart uh, infarction, the dead cells are there in my heart, and I can take a small filter paper, put it here and stick it, stick it up. I'll put it there and stick it. So that those defective areas will now take up these cells so that I will get out of the problem of uh, uh, that. So likewise it has been done in the system, so this is the same thing with somebody else in public and this is what we have done and this is the filter paper on which these cells are actually going. So you can actually see that this is the petri dish and this is on the filter paper. So you can take that filter paper which contains heart cells, put it on the heart where there is a defect. And those hearts will become normal. You understand? Okay. So I think I'm going to stop here and um, <coughs> thank you for this. And uh, I, I can answer some questions.
So by looking at this polar part, you know what is the inside matter that you see there. Good, any other? Anybody? Do you know that? Did you understand? Did you understand? Tell the half thing to produce 